transition growing up in uh, Long Island, Port Chef Station. Uh, we, it was like a big rock and roll community, you know what I mean? And uh, a lot of the guys in my neighborhood, I'd always hang out with older guys, my brothers, and everyone was playing rock and roll. And the first thing I heard that really made me was like love music was The Who, you know? I just fell in love with The Who. And uh, The Who led me to like so many other things like Zeppelin, you know, uh, Pink Floyd, um, Peter Gabriel, trying to think what else I, you know, and then after that whole thing, you know, then I, I, I've listened to so many different types of music where my first concert, like the first guitar I have is a really funny story. My brother was actually learning how to play guitar. And this uh, guitar teacher in our neighborhood named Jim Kleinklaus, I never forget this guy's name. Uh, he was teaching everyone in the neighborhood. And he was a great guitar player. And he was teaching my brother. My brother wasn't getting it right. So my brother kind of gave up the guitar. And I was like, hey, Ma, I want to take guitar lessons. So I picked up the guitar. It was just like Sokova. We bought it like Sears or something like that. So I started playing guitar. First song you learn is Smoke on the Water, of course. You know what I mean? Then you hear Boston and you hear Bad Company. And you hear all of these things. Jethro Tull back in. Man, there's just so many, like, such great music back then. And, uh, and my first concert was actually the Ramones in Central Park. It was a free concert. It was like some kind of Pepsi thing, I remember. It was like 70 something, 78, 77, somewhere around there. And I wasn't allowed to go. And I snuck out with a guy in my neighborhood, an older guy, and we went to the concert. And um, when I went to the Ramones, all I was, oh, oh, hey, oh, and I was like, what is this? And I just remember looking at those guys with leather jackets and Johnny Ramone, you know, and Dee Dee and Joey. And uh, I don't know if it was Tommy at the time. Maybe it was, you know what I mean? It was just like one of those things where you go, what is this? Because you don't, you know, you listen to The Who, you listen to all these other things, and obviously you see The Ramones, and you're like, as a kid, you're like, whoa, you know? And uh, that changed everything for me, too. And all of a sudden, you listen to, like, The Ramones, The Clash, Sex Pistols, and then... Next concert, I go to Van Halen at Na in Nassau Coliseum, 1978, I think, with Black Sabbath. They opened up for Black Sabbath. And then I, and you see David Lee Roth come out, and I think they opened up when I'm on fire. That's what I think I remember. And David Lee Roth comes out with the kicks, Eddie Van Halen's, you know, and the bombs, and Michael Anthony, and, you know, Alex Van Halen. It changes your life back then when you see that stuff, you know? And I was like, what is this? You know, so, and I loved everything. I was never like, oh, I'm a punk guy, I'm a rock guy, I'm a classic rock guy, I'm a metal guy. And I, and I was there to see Sabbath, because I was a big Sabbath fan. So, that just changed everything for me, too. All of a sudden, I was like, wow, man, David Lee Roth, this guy, you know, it just blew me away. And then, you know, and then I saw Aerosmith, you know, for like $8.50 back in the day. I saw Cheap Trick at the Calderon. I think I was one of my next kind. That's another thing. Cheap Trick's a, you know, huge influence, you know. And um, Aerosmith, you know, I never got to see Zeppelin. I did see The Who, but I didn't see it with Keith Moon. I saw it with, uh, what's his face? Uh, I'm blowing a blank. It was at the Garden. They sold it out for like five nights in a row. Kenny Jones. And it was when... Uh, Townsend ripped his hand open. Adultery came out, and he played on the stage. Townsend went, got his hand sewed up, stitched up, came back, and finished the show. That's why I was like, man, that's fucking rock and roll. And, um, and of course, Alice Cooper, you know what I mean, those records. You know, all of these records were in my life, you know? So, that's like pretty much a bit of my history growing up listening to music. Yeah. Well, I got my first guitar when I was 14 years old. And I was playing guitar for about two years. And then um, I met these guys called the Rondinellis. And they were playing at a roller skating rink. That I, I was like a rink rat. They used to call me a rink rat. I was on a speed skating team. And they were in this band called Tusk. And they came in and they played the roller skating rink one night. And I saw these guys come with the big shoes. And I was like, these guys are so cool, man. It's, I want to do this. So I walked up to the stage and, and I asked them if they needed any help loading the gear out. And here I am, this little kid with long hair. And Bobby the drummer just took a liking to me. And he's like, yeah, kid, help us out. So I helped him with the gear. And then I would go over to their house like every afternoon after school and watch them rehearse. And that's where I really learned 
music and Bobby pulled me aside one day and he said, he says, listen kid, he goes, lose the guitar, learn how to play bass and sing, there's guitar players in every corner around here. He's like, and you'll thank me years later. <laughs> so I picked up the bass and I started learning how to play bass and then singing and that's when I was about 16 and then I had a couple bands, you know what I mean, like bands with my buddies, like with Lewis, my buddy Lewis, and this other guy named Bruce and Jay and, and Paulie D. And we'd play in the basements, we'd play Rolling Stones and all kinds of stuff. And then uh, when I started getting serious, that was a band called Rough Cut in 1980. I don't know, well, No Deal, that's another band. It's the other guy, Mike Wolf, who was a great guitar player in our neighborhood. And these other guys, we were doing cover songs and like playing parties, remember back in the day, where people would just hang out and drink beer and smoke weed and you're like 14 years old. And, um, and we did that and then I joined, we put this band Rough Cut together with my brother in like 1982. And that's when we started playing the clubs and we started becoming like popular around the tri-state area. We were doing really well. And, um, and we did that for like, I don't know, three years, we, we had a good run. And then they changed the age limit to drinking. That was another thing they did back in New, you know, New York area. And then uh, I got a phone call from uh, a producer guy named Joey Ballon one day. And uh, said, hey, Tommy, this is uh, Joey Ballon producing this band Warlock out here. And uh, Tommy Bone, the guitar player, says you're the bass player. Would you be interested in checking out Warlock? So I went down to, I think it was the power station at the time. I went down there, met Doro, heard the stuff. Next thing you know, a couple months later, I'm on tour in Germany now. You know what I mean? But before that, I was in a band called, I was in Ron Dinelli. The guys who started me, I was in a band with them. And this guy, Ray Gillen, who was in Badlands, passed away. And we had that thing going. That was a great band, but that's another long story. So anyway, the Warlock thing, I did that from 1987 to like 89, 90. And, uh... And then it just kind of, when she changed the name to Doro, it, the whole thing got, you know, a little like weird, you know, with the ex-manager and stuff like that. So I decided to leave that. And then me, Bobby, and my buddy John Levin, who plays in Docking, we put a band together called Big Trouble. We had a record deal on Atlantic. The record never came out. We did all this stuff. So then I was like, you know what? I'm out of here. I'm going to move to L.A. So I moved to L.A. like in 1990, 89, 90, somewhere around there. Got in a Camaro for fifteen hundred bucks, and I was like, "I'm out of here." And I drove to L.A. And uh, first guy I met was Jeff Pilson at the Rainbow. You know, that's where you meet everybody at the Rainbow Bar and Grill. And I heard he was needed a bass player. And then I got a call uh, from a buddy of mine saying Ozzy needs a bass player. David Lee Roth is looking for a bass player. So there's three people looking for bass players. And I'm staying with Ray at the Oakwoods. And he was letting me stay there because he was in Badlands at the time. And uh, so I get a call. I talk to Zach because Warlock opened up for Ozzy. And I go down and I audition. I audition and, and the audition goes great. So when Randy was playing drums, this is right around uh, Miracle. Was it Miracle? Oh, the next record, No More Tears. And uh, audition goes great. Zach goes, yo, Tomo. Fuck, man, you killed it. You know, you're the best guy to come in. We got one more guy to check out. You know, but man, you definitely, I'm telling you, this looks good for you. I was like, great, Zach. And I never forget it. I get another call from, I forgot who called me about David Lee Roth. So I go to David Lee Roth's house. This is all like in a couple days where I was like, this is ridiculous. So I go audition for David Lee Roth. I'm in David's house in his basement. And this is when, uh, uh, which Jason Becker was, was playing guitar with him. And Greg Bissonette was playing drums. And we saw playing songs and stuff like that. And just when Jason was just, I guess, getting his illness, which is really sad. Maze, like kids, so talented too. And uh, we were playing the songs, and he was sitting down in Roth, and they had a camera like this. And Roth came out, and he's like, "So who are you, man?" Like with his David Lee Roth thing. I was like, "Tommy." He goes, "Where are you from, Tommy?" I said, "Long Island." I was like, "So Tommy from Long Island, show me what you got." And it was like, and I was sitting there going, fuck David Lee Roth. <laughs> so we play like Yankee Rose and do all this stuff. And and he goes, man, I like you, Tommy, from Long Island. And, it was, and I was like, oh, this is great. So I'm like going, oh, this is cool. This would be great if I, could, if I had two gigs like this, you know. And I haven't even met, I just met Jeff. And Jeff was doing some other things. 
and I'm thinking, wow, I got the Ozzy gig went great, the David Lee Roth gig went great. See what happens. This would be a blessing if something like that happened. I get a call from Zach going, yo, Tom, oh man, uh, Ozzy didn't like your hair, bro. Uh, sorry, you ain't gonna get the gig. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, this guy Mike came in, Ozzy liked the way he looked better. And, and he's like, I'm sorry. And I was like, all right, it's cool. I was like, fuck, I'll cut my hair, I'll shit. <laughs> so then the next day, I forgot to call me. I think it was Mike, might have been Bissonette. Called me, he's like, uh, yeah, um, Dave didn't like your hair. He, he wanted to get a guy with blonde hair. So that's, so when that happened, I was like, all right, fuck this shit. You know what I mean? So I was like, I'm just going to fucking play punk rock music. So then I called Pilsen, and then Pilsen, Pilsen was like, hey, you know, I got this band, War and Peace, you should come down, check it out. I go down and jam with him and Vinny. I was like, cool. I was like, all right, cool, I'll, I'll do the gig. Anyway, so then I, I went down and I played with Jeff and Vinny and this guy named Darren Household, and then we started this War and Peace thing. And that lasted for, I forgot how long it lasted. And then Jeff revamped War and Peace, and that's when uh, he brought in Satchel from Still Panther, Russ, who's another phenomenal guitar player, Ricky Parent, the late Ricky Parent from uh, Enough's Enough, who I miss. And uh, we did that for a while, and then it fizzled out. And then I actually joined C.C. DeVille's band called Needle Park. And that was 90-something. And that was with uh, James Kotak from Scorpions, Kelly Hansen from Farna, and myself and C.C. And that was that lasted, I don't know, five months. <laughs> that was it, it was over. But that was really cool. And then after that, then I said, you know what, I'm just gonna cut my hair, man, I'm gonna start a punk band. Cause I got sick of playing, like, I was like, you know what, if no one likes my hair, fuck it, I'll just shave it off. So I did it. And then I started a punk band. And then, uh, believe it or not, I was writing all these songs that were just like angry punk songs. Cause I was just like, I'm tired. You know, it was just my way of just saying, fuck you to everybody, you know what I mean? Cause you know, when you're, you, like, you're just like, fuck all you people. So uh, I put this band together and, um, was playing around LA, no one liked us, because we had like really crazy songs, man. Like, <laughs> it's just stupid. And uh, I finally met this guy named Garth Richardson, Joe Barisi, and uh, we did this record. We did a demo, and we got a record deal. And uh, that was a band called P.O.L. in 1994. I was playing bass in that. And uh, that lasted, we had like a number one song at like Alternative Radio, it was doing really great, a song called Stupid. And, um, that lasted maybe a year. The label went under Giant Records. It was over. And uh, I'll never forget Doug Thaler calling me up, my manager at the time, going, Tommy, come on, home. It's over. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, the label folded. You're done. I was like, really? So then I'm done. I remember going back to Hollywood, me and my buddy Lewis living in my our two-bedroom crummy apartment off of Sunset Boulevard on Sierra Bonita. The carpet looked like, you know, you changed... I don't know how many oil changes were done in the place. It was like we had a milk crate and like a TV and PlayStation. And um, he just looked at me, he's like, what are we gonna do? I was like, he's like, I'm gonna move back to New York. I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna sell all my gear and I'm just gonna write songs until I get evicted out of this place. And he went back to New York. I sold all my equipment. I had like 10 grand worth of gear, I sold it all. I stayed in this apartment until they act actually evicted me because I was like, I'm just gonna stay and hit my 12 track. And as I was getting evicted, Jeff Pilson called me up and said, hey, why don't you come watch my house? I'm gonna go on tour with Dokken for like six, eight months. And I was like, he saved my life. So I go to Pilson's house, I got all these songs. He hears them and he says, uh, you know, this is really, this stuff's like really good, man. I play for my other buddy, Joey. Joey's like, man, you sound like Richard Butler from the Psychedelic Furs. And I didn't even realize, I was just writing stuff. I was like, I'm not gonna write rock and roll, I'm not gonna write punk, I'm gonna write, like, I wanted to do like Bruce Springsteen, Peter Gabriel, Sting Police, you know what I mean? Like stuff like that, I wanted to go another route, you know? And I wanted to just change up and just push myself. And Pilsen was like, dude, you're gonna get a record deal on this. And I was like, I didn't know what that was, you know? Cause the last time I was like, I don't want a record deal. So next thing I know, Long story short, I played for this guy named Hugo Burnham. He used to be the drummer gang of four. He's at this publishing company. He calls me. He's like, Tommy, hey, your stuff's amazing. I want to sign you. So, anyway, Hugo led to this other thing where I had this problem with one of the guys at the label, a giant. 
you know, it's another story. And uh, he was the president now of EMI Publishing. He didn't want to sign me because he knew who I was in the punk band. He's like, I don't like this guy. So the deal got blown out. And then I got this manager named John Zagata. And uh, he hooked me up with Keith Forsey because, you know, let me and Keith started doing these demos. And uh, another thing, like Keith, another talented guy. He did all my favorite records, all the Psych Fur records, Billy Idol stuff, Simple Minds. And uh, that led to this guy, Steve Patch, who worked at Capitol. He got my demo. And uh, he said, hey, I want to come hear you play this stuff. So this was all like after they, after Hugo tried to get me to steal, it went down with EMI, got folded because this guy at the company didn't like me, which I went in and apologized because I was like, listen, dude, I was young, you know, you know, angry, a lot of stuff, you know, and, you, and this whole thing in life, you got to look at your problems, man, and realize them and work on them, you know what I mean? And that's what I did. And, and, I, and, I, and I wasn't the same guy anymore. And he was like, you know, I remember this guy and now you're this other guy, who are, and I was like, hey man, it's called growing. You know, it's like I didn't have any fucking one to teach me this stuff. I had to learn it all myself. So you make these mistakes because you don't have anyone going, this is not the way you do things, Tommy. Like another guy, Kenny McPherson at Warner Chapel, great fucking publisher guy, said to me one time, he says, Tommy, the Scottish guy, he's like, you can't wear your heart on your sleeve, mate. You're doing a lot of things, and he's told me some great stuff, and I took his advice, and I listened to him. And uh, so anyway, so Steve Pass heard the demo. He flew out to L.A. I did a showcase in Jeff Pilson's kitchen with a guitar, and I played like just like to some of the backing drums, and I played along with the drums. I sang. He looked at me. He's like, "I want to bring you to Gary Gersh's house." I showcased at Gary Gersh's house on like a Sunday afternoon in Brentwood across from OJ's house or somewhere like that. I'll never forget it. He looked at me and he goes, I want to sign you to a recording contract. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah. And that was it. And then I had this record deal on uh, Capitol Records in 98, 97. And uh, of course, Gary got fired from the company. So I made this great record. No one did anything for it. It came out. Robbie Williamson just got signed to Capitol. So it was like a really bad time for me. So that record didn't come out, it got shelved. Then I was producing, writing bands, dude. I could go on and on. Like I got all these bands record deals and first band I got a big record deal for was a band called Revis back in the day. Great band. And uh, got the, I would take these bands and I would develop them, you know, and, and write songs with them and, and, and show them and tell them, listen man, save your money, do this, do that. You know, because it's like the record industry, I, I tell them, it's like, listen, you don't know if your record's even going to come out because it happened to me twice, you know? So, and you go through this process, and I had this other guy named Brooks Buford, I got him a record deal, I had this girl named Brady, I had so many people, and then I had my own record company with Jimmy Iovine and Ron Fair at Interscope Records for a while, and um, I learned a lot that way. And I was just producing and writing. That's where I met Lady Gaga and all these other people. And then Pete Gambarg, who's another great guy, you know what I mean? I did a lot of stuff with, um, you know, like publishing, writing songs with Chris Dorch. So all these things led to these other things. So, and then after that, I moved to Nashville. Like I was like, let me, let me get out of LA a little bit. Let me move to Nashville, change it up. This is in 2000, I think it was maybe 2008, 2009, around that. This is before everybody was there. I was down there when no one was there. You know, the first meeting I had, this guy looks at me. He's like, what y'all know about country music? I'm looking at him like, how you doing? My name's Tommy. And this guy, I never forget that meeting. He goes, y'all come up in here with your black spiky hair and your tattoos and earrings. I never forget this. And he goes, so what do you know about country music? And I look at him, I was like, I lean over, I go, listen, pal. I go, what makes you think I'm here for fucking country music? And he looked at me, he's like, I like you. Because I, I was like, I wasn't going there for country music, I was just going there to write songs, you know? And that led to me meeting Bob Ezrin. And then Bob wanted to sign this band, Run Runner, that I was working with at the time. And uh, Jack Pony, another good friend of mine who I love, signed him. You know, and at the time, the, the timing was weird, you know? I never really got to work with Jack on that, but anyway. So I met Bob, and Bob, the uh, first project he gave me was, uh, he says, I want you to do something with this, this track I got. 
I just got it from Peter. Uh, no, I got it from Lou. And I, and I get this track, and it's Lou Reed singing Salisbury Hill. And I was listening to it. I was like, well, what do you want me to do with it? Because it's Lou Reed, you know? And he's like, I want you to put drums to it and all this stuff to it. So I put all this stuff on it, and um, it just happened to be it worked out where Bob was like, all right, cool. Let's do some projects. Let's start working together. So I start working with Bob on some other things, and then Alice comes in. They want to do these... Uh, these redos for Alice and Bob says, Tommy, you do it. So I start doing it. It's coming out really good. Then Bob all of a sudden gets in on it. I look at Bob and I go, you know what? I go, Alice is going to love this when he hears it. It sounds just like it. And he's like, ah, let's see what happens. Long story short, Alice comes in. He looks at Bob. He turns around. And he says, what do you think of Welcome to My Nightmare? And Bob was like, I love it. So and then all of a sudden he's like, let's get to work on it. So then all of a sudden now I'm working with Alice, but before that, I was a roadie for Alice too. That's another thing. Before I got my record deal, I actually roadied for fucking Alice Cooper <laughs> and Ryan Roxy and Paul Taylor and Reb. And uh, I, I, I know I'm jumping around a little bit because all of a sudden I remember these things and I go, God. I saw. I, mean, I was working for like a hundred dollars. It was like it was unbelievable. I had no money, and it was like before I got my big record deal with Capital. You know, it was like crazy. So, and then I met Alice too before that working with a band called Still Standing. Calico was dating one of the guys in the band and he came to my house. So it was like this weird thing and all of a sudden I see him in the studio and next thing I know, you know, we're working on the record and he says, brings in Steve Hunter and Steve Hunter was one of the guys who was like, yeah, we should get Tommy to be in the band too. And it was like, and, and that's how I got into Alice Cooper. Just like that, you know? And then Alice, we're doing that. And then just working on records that leads to the Hollywood van. So it's like one of these things. It's just been a crazy thing when I think about it. You know what I mean? Like playing bass, playing guitar. Because I was playing bass. You know, and Alice was like, well, can you play guitar? And I was like, I can learn. You know what I mean? Because I was playing, because I could play rhythm. You know what I mean? So then I really learned how to play guitar by playing with Alice these last six years, you know? Well, the Hollywood Vampires is one of those things. Alice uh, had this idea. He wanted to do this uh, drinking club, you know, from back in his day at the Rainbow with all those guys. And he's like, it would be a great idea if we could do this, you know, tribute record to my dead drunk friends. And and we were in a studio, and it was with Bob. And, and we were like, yeah, this would be a great idea. Who can we get? And from when Alice did Dark Shadows with Johnny, and Johnny would get up and jam with us every time. Alice was like, Johnny's a great guitar player. We should maybe get him involved in it. And then we went to Johnny's place. We met, we had a meeting, and then we threw this whole thing together, and then we just started working on it. Um, it was actually Alice, Johnny, Bruce, uh, Bob, and myself, and we just started working on all these demos. And then the, the Alice Cooper band, we went and cut all the tracks, you know, with Bruce and Johnny, live. And, um, and then that's how that whole thing, then Joe came in, and then all these other, Paul McCartney, Robbie Krieger, Joe Walsh, probably, uh, I'm trying to think, who else, man? Dave Grohl. So it was all of a sudden all these cats are coming in and it turned into this thing that we didn't expect to be like that, you know? And then uh, next thing you know, we put the record out, we're playing the Grammys, you know? And then Matt and Duff came on board. So it was like one of those things where, you know, me playing with Joe was like, you know, here I am. I watched Joe growing up, he's one of my idols, and I get to play with him and just look at him every night. And then with Johnny, you know what I mean? I'm like sitting there, and, and Johnny's the most generous person ever, you know? And you get to play with these guys, you know? I, don't, I, don't, I can't explain it because it's like, sometimes you sit back and you go, you know, I know so many guys that are so talented, a lot more talented than me, you know? But I work hard, you know? And I just look at these guys and I'm like, man, this is like, it's those moments where you'll hold on them forever, you know what I mean? And uh, I don't know, I, I can't explain it. It's just like one of those things when you're just hanging out with these guys and playing with them, it's great. And, and getting to fucking do, sorry for cursing, but uh, getting to play with Alice, you know, that's another thing too. When I just sit up on stage and I'm playing like under my wheels with Cooper and I just look at that face, you know, you know, telephone is ringing and I'm like, this is cool, you know, it's great.